Hey everybody, what's going on? John here with Feldman Physical Therapy and Performance. Welcome back to the channel. Thanks for tuning in today. Today I want to talk a little bit about the knee, more specifically the meniscus within the knee. A lot of people have heard about the meniscus and in fact some people are probably scared of it. It's that dreaded knee injury uh, that seems to plague a lot of people as we get older and in very active individuals. Unfortunately, there's quite a bit of misinformation surrounding it. So uh, today, you know, the goal of today's video is to really demystify it a little bit. Um, I, I want to give you a little bit more of an in-depth look at this, as well as what do we do if and when the meniscus is actually an issue and it's actually a problem. So um, I want you to stay tuned for the end because we're going to talk about the outcomes of conservative management, where you know obviously you can address it with physical therapy, proper strength work, or anything of the sort. And we're going to compare those outcomes with surgical interventions or even injections. So uh, definitely stay tuned for that. You're going to want to hear a little bit about that towards the end because that's the goal of today's talk. So uh, as always, we really, really appreciate your, uh, you know, your subscriptions and your, uh, your follows. It you know, gives us a great opportunity to get more information out to more people. So if you wouldn't mind just kind of hitting that uh, like and subscribe button below, or if you really find it useful, uh, give us a little share. We really, really appreciate that. So uh, getting right along into the video, into the meat of today's uh, talk, this is the right knee, okay? This is uh, looking at the right knee from the front. Um, this is your thigh bone up here. This is your shin bone coming down below. And this is that smaller, skinnier bone on the outside of your uh, lower leg called the fibula. And this is your kneecap. If we were to open this up and kind of flip that down and take a look, right here, you have that little soft tissue ring in between the bottom part of your thigh bone and just above the shin bone. It actually sits on the shelf of the shin bone. So if I bring it in a little closer, you can kind of see the meniscus there, all right? And if I flip it around and give you the back view, you can also see the meniscus and you can also see your posterior and uh, anterior collateral ligaments going right uh, you know, up and down. So that's your PCL and ACL. So now that you have an idea of what the meniscus is and where, uh, sorry, where the meniscus is in the joint, let's talk a little bit about what it does. So obviously you can see it sits right between those two bones and the knee is, you know, largest joint by surface area. It takes a brunt of the force whenever we do anything. So that meniscus acts as a nice shock absorber, okay? Um, you have a nice cushion piece of material in between the two bones of your knee. And if we kind of flip it up like this, bending that knee, right? So if the knee bends from the side, you can kind of see it really encompasses the whole plateau, that's what we call it, of the shin bone, that shelf that it sits on. So your meniscus is going to be like two C's, one on the left side, one on the right side, or one on the inside and one on the outside of the joint. So it's really, really important that we have that um, to take some of the stress off the bone. It's like a little tiny extra shock absorber. Um, you know, think of just the, the soles on the bottom of your shoes, right? Or even the, the cushions, you can put inserts in your shoes and people can really feel the difference about, oh wow, that feels like it's really, really cushioned. It feels much more comfortable. So uh, that's really what we're dealing with here in the knee with the meniscus. It's a nice little shock absorber for us. The problem is that guy can get kind of cranky. So, we have, let's, let's break down meniscus injuries into two different types. We have acute injuries and we have degenerative injuries. Acute injuries happen uh, more commonly in active individuals who are planting and twisting their knee at high rates of force. So think of field athletes or multi-directional athletes um, or somebody who kind of slips and falls on the ice. They twist their knee, uh, getting up from a deep crouched squat position or kneeling on the floor and you know your knee is bent a lot and you're in a position it's not normally in and all of a sudden you try and push up through that leg but you're twisting at the same time. These are all common uh, ways that the, the meniscus can become injured acutely, right? Um, so we associate that with a specific mechanism of injury, usually a lot of swelling in the joint, there's a lot of pain, discomfort, decreased range of motion, um, and then a limp that ensues. Now, on the other end of that, we have degenerative tears. So degenerative tears are just like they sound, they come over time. So there's not gonna be a specific mechanism of, of injury. Um, again, this is a shock absorber, it's a wearable part. And there's a reason why wearable parts are not uh, covered under warranty by the, uh, the warranty companies. It, we expect it to break down and over time that shock absorber will break down. Um, you know, so th those are the two different types of, um, you know, meniscus injuries, right? The degenerative type we usually see in people over time, especially if they're more active, they did a lot of repetitive bending, squatting, lifting, jumping. If they were able to escape any kind of injury during those um, active activities, that's a good thing, but the meniscus will still break down. And how do we know this? Because MRI findings 
tell us that up to 60% of individuals, I'm sorry, 67% of individuals will have asymptomatic meniscus tears, meaning asymptomatic, they're not gonna have any discomfort, but upon imaging, they found that 67% of people were positive for having a meniscus tear. And when it comes down to it, MRIs are very sensitive. What does that mean? That means an MRI image is going to be really, really good at identifying anything that's wrong. It's not very specific, meaning it's not going to tell us what the exact root cause is of what it found. But the bottom line is MRIs are very sensitive and they're going to pick up meniscus tears if they're there or anything else that's there. So MRI findings show us of a lot of studies and a lot of individuals up to 67% of people have them and they're asymptomatic. So uh, that's the first thing that we want to talk about. Um, and the other thing is MRIs will also found and studies have found that up to 50% of those have happened spontaneously. People just didn't even know it. And they had an image, um, you know, maybe five years ago, a comparative image, something that they can reference. And then they look forward. Uh, so prospectively or retrospectively, and they found that they didn't have it at one point in their life. And then a few years later, they did have that tear. And again, it was just completely spontaneous. So that's what we're talking about, where you can have these degenerative tears um, or asymptomatic tears without any kind of symptom, you don't have any pain, any swelling or decreased range of motion. So um, there's a lot of, you know, mystery surrounding meniscus uh, injuries and, and the entity of the meniscus itself. And we really want to understand that. And we have to understand that if we're going to understand how to best address these injuries, if and when they do happen, or if and when you find yourself um, in that position. So, uh, you know, a lot of good evidence supporting the notion that Hmm, okay, maybe we can get away with treating these a little bit differently than just getting right into surgery or a surgical fix, especially because we have the evidence to show us that a number of people, a lot of people have them and they don't even have any symptoms. So perhaps it's not the actual tear that's the issue um, and maybe there's some other underlying cause. And you know, that being said, what we often find with meniscus tears, pardon me, is an associated um, loss of range of motion or loss of strength. Both of those are going to result in an increased loss of function. And it's probably going to inhibit that person and be really, really frustrating. So then you go down that mental approach of, uh, you know, every day I'm limited by this knee and I know I have that tear there. When in reality, it might not be the tear that's the issue because we know that people can have tears without having issues. Maybe it's more of the associated loss of strength and loss of range of motion that aided in that increased degeneration or facilitated uh, an increased degeneration over time. So uh, we have a lot of long-term outcomes that show us that we can actually get by and, and treat these meniscus issues with aggressive strengthening and improving range of motion. So that's what I wanna get into a, a little bit now. Um, you know, so we know that the meniscus is a shock absorber. I right? just wanna recap a little bit. Uh, we know that there are studies and imaging to show us that there are a significant portion of people of an older age that have meniscus tears that are asymptomatic, so they don't even know it. And we know that we can have acute injuries and we can have degenerative injuries, okay? So those three things are, are what we've covered so far, and that's gonna kind of take us into what do we do next? So what, what happens when you do have a meniscus tear? Uh, and again, what does the evidence show us? What is the history pointing to? So um, again, meniscus tears, uh, if you have any questions right now, hit pause, think about it. Um, maybe throw it in the comments section, but if not, we're just gonna get right into it. So what happens when you do have a meniscus tear? You know, conventional wisdom said, let's get in there and let's remove that piece. That's, that's called a meniscectomy, that's a procedure. It's a uh, minimally invasive procedure where they do it arthroscopically, so you don't have to cut the knee open. Uh, what they do is they drill little portholes and they'll go in and they will remove it. And again, my father uh, is a retired orthopedic surgeon, a sports medicine specialist, did a lot of knees in his day. I watched him do a number of, sur a number of surgeries, which is an incredible experience. Um, you know, but you know, back in the 90s, early 2000s, you know, we didn't know as much as we do now. And now we have a lot more evidence to show us long-term outcomes of conservative management versus uh, surgical management or injections. So in the past, we used to go in there and remove that piece because sometimes the knee would end up locking. There was a lot of swelling involved with it initially and they thought, okay, let's just get it out of there and see how the outcomes are. Well, let's fast forward now. Again, we have a lot more research at our disposal, a lot more um, you know, trials to, to, to see prospectively what's going to happen. And so one of the studies that I love is uh, there was actually 10 studies that was done and they followed just over 1500 patients um, and they were either in injection groups, uh, conservative management with physical therapy and strengthening, or uh, they had surgical interventions to remove the piece. 
Now, what they found was no significant intergroup differences in knee pain or knee function in long-term follow-ups. So what does that tell us? That tells us that long-term outcomes were very, very similar, whether you had that piece removed, whether you've got an injection, or whether you just treated it conservatively and did some aggressive strengthening and addressed any of those associated risk factors that go along with it. Decreased range of motion, uh, decreased strength, decreased function, um, you know, probably even poor motor control as well. So, uh, you know, that's a very powerful finding and that's not the only study that confirms that long-term outcomes are equal in conservative versus surgical management groups. So, something really, really important to take home. Um, so, what do we do with that information then? Well we take that and we kind of tell people, all right, you may or may not have a meniscus tear. You may or may not have that tear contributing to whatever symptoms you have right now. Um, so let's take a look. We put people through a full evaluation uh, specific to the knee, kind of gauge their function. Can they produce enough strength? Can they do what they need to do on their self-reported goals? Um, are they an athlete or do they just want to be able to get up and down the stairs and kneel down and garden, whatever it might be? Um, small little anecdote, uh, when I was playing in my men's league for soccer a few years ago, um, it's funny, we actually had four physical therapists on the team, all orthopedics, and um, that was great. Whenever anybody got hurt, it was like, time out, you guys, come on over. Uh, but one of my friends who is also a local uh, ortho physical therapist, he, he banged his knee up pretty bad. Um, planted, twisted, he got hit at the same time, and he had confirmed with pretty significant uh, meniscus tear. Well, he's like, I, dude, I definitely don't want to get surgery, so let's come up with a plan of attack here. And we just came up with a great plan, and for about six weeks, he busted his butt in the gym. And it was just aggressive strengthening, um, improving range of motion, um, you know, decreasing pain, so desensitizing the area, um, getting the swelling down. And he was back playing with us before the end of the season. And a lot of people would not have thought that if you just look at face value, the amount of swelling he had, what the MRI showed that his uh, meniscus tear was, uh, you know, people get kind of, you know, uh, shy as soon as that happens and they immediately get the blinders on and say, well, if it's that bad, you know, we have to uh, get in there and take it out. When in reality, it's not always the case. So I always love that little anecdote. Um, and I'm almost certain that I have some myself. I haven't gotten the images to confirm it, but just based on my injury history, my activity history and my endurance activity now, there's a pretty good chance that I'm down that realm of degenerative tears. Um, but ultimately, I'm not gonna do anything about that, and neither should you. Uh, so, well, I shouldn't say, I should say you, you shouldn't worry about it. What we should do is maintain proper strength and range of motion and function at all times, across the board for whatever activity we wanna do. So, um, you know, that's really the take home there is that, you know, those studies kind of show us that there's a really good chance that you can address this successfully with conservative management, with an aggressive strength training routine, improving range of motion, improving strength, improving function with specific tasks, such as deep bending, squatting, kneeling down, going up and down stairs. Uh, that's the goal and that's the take home behind those studies and behind today's video. So uh, we want to encourage you to kind of take a step back if you suspect that you might have a knee injury or a meniscus injury, or if you've been told that you have one, or if your friends and family have one. Take a step back and just say, okay, let's look at what the uh, evidence shows us and what the information shows us. And that's that, you know what, surgery will always be there. But if we can avoid surgery with a conservative uh, management initially and your long-term outcome is gonna be the same, I say we do that every day and twice on Saturday. No need to subject your body to going under the knife, to the anesthesia, to the injection, because even after the surgery, the knee is gonna swell up on you and you're gonna to have to fight an uphill battle there too, you know, in the initial acute period post-operatively. So um, if we have all that information, I say, let's just get right to it. You know, um, you know don't spin your wheels, no need to, to, you know, to have this mystery behind it, let's get right to it, you know, down to the brass tacks, and that's improving range of motion, improving strength, and improving function right away, because that has phenomenal outcomes on even acute meniscus tears. So, uh, you know, by no means is this saying that surgery is never warranted, guys. Uh, you know, that is a disclaimer. We always want to acknowledge, you know, modern medicine and procedures are phenomenal. And there are different types of meniscus tears. Um, I didn't get down that uh, rabbit hole today because that really wasn't the take home message. Uh, you know, but ultimately there are different types of tears that may end up influencing the knee mechanics of the joint. So when you start to have that true biomechanical locking, if you're having uh, sharp pains with repeated activities throughout the day, sometimes it is warranted, you know, different injuries, um, you know, are going to affect people differently. And, you know, I always said, actually, I wasn't, 
I own, but I heard it. Injuries are like snowflakes. No two are identical, okay? But we know certain trends and patterns that are followed. So uh, we encourage you to, you know, share this video with your friends, guys. We, we hope it helped. Um, you know, again, so to recap, the meniscus tears, it's a really important part of the knee, but it's not the end of the world if something does happen to it. Conservative management versus surgical management, very, very similar outcomes. And there are a lot of great approaches that we can take conservatively nowadays, um, you know, to get you, uh, get you, get you back out that door and back to what you, uh, you love doing. So, um, if you guys have any questions, you know, please throw them down there. Uh, again, give us a subscribe, give us a like, we really, really appreciate all of your support. Um, but you know, we want to hear from you. What are your stories with, you know, the knee? Are you having any knee pain right now? What's worked for you? What hasn't worked for you? Do you have any friends that are going through it? Um, anything at all, you know, leave us a comment. We would love to hear from you. We love interacting with everybody. So, uh, thanks for tuning in guys. Have a great rest of the day and we'll see you next time.